Well, greetings, everyone. Thank you for making the time and, and joining us today. Uh, we'll get started briefly. But again, this is the second webinar of this series, which we're excited to showcase the whole research for us. While we're waiting, shall we launch that poll so we can get a sense of who's in our audience today? Good idea, Amanda. Again, if you want to take the time to fill out the poll, it's good to know who, who's in the audience. Um, this should be a, a good broad overview. And again, for those that can join us on Friday, uh, we'll actually get on on the ground and, and see some of the stuff that we talk about today. In the poll, please notice that there are three questions. Uh, we've got, where are you from? What background brings you to this meeting? And are you familiar with the Holt Research Forest? <laughs> Great. All right, so again, as folks are zooming in, we ask if you could just take a brief moment to fill out this poll um, so we can get a sense of where are you all coming from? What background or backgrounds are bringing you to this meeting? And are you familiar with the Holt Research Forest? This will give our presenters a little bit of a sense of who you are all in the audience. Um, during the webinar, um, we ask that if you have questions, please type them into the chat window. Um, our, speakers, our speakers are going to talk for, um, for about half or two thirds of the time, and we have plenty of time for questions. So um, depending, on, uh, depending on how much time we have, we might be able to open up um, the open up, uh, allow you to unmute yourselves later. But for now, please direct your questions to the chat window. We are two minutes after the top of the hour. Um, and it looks like 94% of folks have participated. So I'm going to end the poll in three, two, one, bink, and sharing the results. So all of you can see now. 73% um, of you are zooming in from Maine. Um, 21% said from New England. We have a couple of folks from outside New England and we have a Canadian. Welcome, thanks for joining us. What background or backgrounds bring you to this meeting? Um, we have, um, most of you are coming here as foresters. So welcome to the club. Um, we're really glad to hear, uh, have you here with us. And um, we also have a good smattering of interested public and conservation related folks or other natural resources professionals um, and scientists. Very important for this. Um, and are you familiar with the Holt Research Forest? So um, over a third of you have been there. Um, uh, one in five or so have, have been there or have heard of the Holt Forest, but have never visited. Um, a quarter of you have not heard of it. So um, this will be interesting, I think, for everybody to learn a little bit about the Holt Research Forest. So thank you for taking the time to let us know who you are and how familiar you are with the Holt Research Forest. With that, I'll turn it back to Aaron for our introduction to today's discussion. Thank you, Amanda. And again, this is a joint effort between the Center for Research on Sustainable Forest and the Forest Stewards Guild. So thank you to Amanda and Logan for helping with the logistics. Meg is the one kind of running the show. So if you have any technical issues, uh, just reach out to her directly. Again, this is our second uh, webinar of the second attempt of this uh, science and practice series. We're very excited to have you join us and talk about uh, some of the issues affecting Maine. Again, the theme of this year's uh, webinar series is on the different forest types of Maine. So we started off up in the Penobscot Experimental Forest in central Maine on Spruce Fir. Uh, today, we're going down south and looking at the oak pine forest ecosystem in southern Maine. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have uh, Jack Witham, a longtime scientist at the Holt Research Forest, joining us, as well as jo Jonathan Labonte. Uh, and Kelly French of the Maine Tree Foundation. Uh, also Barry Brusla, uh, a consulting forester down in Southern Maine and, and Shane Dugan of the Maine Forest Service uh, to give us a panel. Uh, so we'll follow a similar format uh, as we have in the past. Uh, and hopefully folks can join us on Friday, which looks like a beautiful day for the, for the field tour. Uh, before we begin, I want to do a land acknowledgement statement that we want to respectfully acknowledge the Wabanaki, the people of the Don land, uh, as the original stewards of the forest we discussed today, uh, here at the University of Maine, uh, we are on Marsh Island, which is in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation, where issues of water and territory rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. Uh, the University's uh, Center for Research and Sustainable Forest support forest research and education in the homelands of the Penobscot Nation and the other Wabanaki tribal nations. Uh, we strongly support the inclusion of indigenous science and values in forest stewardship, management, and research. 
Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us. I'm looking forward to today's discussion and I'll turn it back over to Amanda now. All right, thank you, Aaron. Um, so just to let folks know what's happening in today's webinar, we're going to hear a little bit of an overview from Jonathan Labonte from the Main Tree Foundation, um, who will describe a little bit about uh, about the Holt Forest and uh, and some of the work of Main Tree. Um, the real meat of uh, today is going to be hearing from Jack Witham, who has a lot to share um, about uh, many, many, many years of work at, um, at the Holt. Um, Barry Brusla is going to describe uh, the recent timber harvest that took place there. Um, and uh, and then we'll also hear from Shane Dugan, who will provide just some quick perspectives on the on woodland owner outreach, especially in this oak pine forest type and in the mid coast main area. Um, and we may have Kelly French join in with some just quick thoughts on uh, upcoming research um, through the Main Tree Foundation. So with that, um, I'd love to turn it over to Jonathan, and we'll hear a little bit about uh, Main Tree. Great. I think i uh, got one, one slide um, that I'll share with all of you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jonathan Labonte. I'm the executive director of the Main Tree Foundation. Uh, I will be, I'll be brief because uh, I think the knowledge uh, and insights that Jack's going to be able to share from um, his time at the Holt Research Forest is what all of you are, are here for. Um, uh, as a note, Barry uh, Russell is uh, a member of our board of directors, so it's great that she's uh, able to be here as well. Uh, Kelly French, our programs and outreach uh, coordinator, uh, was not able to join us today, um, but uh, I'll certainly be here uh, to uh, represent her and, and field uh, questions as need be. Um, quickly, you know, Main Tree was founded in 1989. Uh, our mission is to educate and advocate for the sustainable use of Maine's forest uh, and the ecological, social, and economic health of Maine's forest communities. And uh, we uh, advanced that mission through a, a series uh, of uh, of programs or a family of programs focused on research, education, and outreach. Uh, most folks know us uh, for our forest-based education work, predominantly as the uh, state sponsor in Maine for Project Learning Tree, uh, which is a standards-aligned curriculum uh, that's an initiative of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Um, linked with Project Learning Tree, we offer um, uh, Forest of Maine Teachers Tours every summer. Um, for uh, 20 to 30 educators per tour, uh, having a chance to really immerse themselves for a week in Maine's North Woods. And we do that with support of the for a broad support of the forest sector, including Maine's Forest Service. Uh, we are the uh, program managers for Maine's Tree Farm Program, which represents over 1,400 uh, uh, woodland owners and over 400,000 acres of sustainably managed family forests uh, within, uh, within the state of Maine. Uh, we also manage a logger credentialing program known as the Certified Logging Professionals. We've been um, supporting that work for a number of years uh, with uh, Mike St. Peter Safety Services as our, as our lead trainer uh, and evaluator of, of loggers out uh, in the woods. Uh, and as of 2014, uh, we are the stewards of the Holt Research Forest, which you'll hear more of its history uh, from Jack shortly. Um, but we're, we're proud to, to be the stewards of this important uh, research uh, site within the state. Um, we're excited for uh, how we might be able to make connections across our other programs, um, from students to teachers to community groups with the research that's being done at Holt, uh, including the applied research uh, that might be of value to small woodland owners and natural resource professionals uh, in the state of Maine, uh, and in particular in the southern part of the state. So I uh, appreciate all of you coming out. Um, feel free to visit maintree.org to learn more. We have a monthly newsletter that highlights activities across our programs, and we'd love to have all of you connected. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jonathan. I think that all those partnerships that were listed on that slide that fall under the Main Tree umbrella really emphasize the, the, the importance of working across lines and, as you said, sharing knowledge. So with that, let's turn it over to Jack. And Jack, if you're able to turn on your camera again and share your screen. Um, then we can really dig deep into some of the great work that's been going on at the Holt and start sharing that across lines as well. Okay, thanks, Amanda. Uh, Jack, your camera isn't on yet. Um, yeah. Let's see. There we go. Okay, got it. Is that better? We gotcha. Okay. And I'll start sharing my screen here. The uh, Holt Research Forest um, is located in the town of Arousic, 
um, which is a coastal island surrounded by the Kennebec, Sassanoa, and Back Rivers. Um, relative, re relatively small island, uh, very close to Bath in Sagadhawk County. That gives, gives you some perspective of, of where we are. Um, the whole research forest property is about 350 acres um, situated along the Back River and uh, Sewell Pond, which is the only large freshwater pond within the town of Arousic. What you see here is a map of our study area. It's approximately um, 100 acres or 40 hectares. There's 40 blocks within that area. And you can see some of the other things that are going on. We have uh, significant acres of um, salt marsh around the perimeters of the property. Um, and it is dominated by a pine oak forest. So just to look at uh, some of the data collection that we've been doing since 1983. Um, this is the listing of all the uh, different tree characteristics that we've been collecting from complete timber inventory on all 40 hectares, um, various parameters of tree measurements, including volume, age, crown mapping, uh, very close look at the regeneration of the forest um, in different size plots and different size trees that we're looking at, um, and doing numerous seed seedling counts as well. Um, so basically, uh, we're trying to look at the forest from everything from the seeds to the mature trees to capture that entire picture of the, of the forest and how it's changing. We're doing lots of other studies in addition to that. Um, this is a, gen a quick listing of some of those. You know, these are truly inadequate to investigate the full scope of the forest ecosystem and none of them were really designed um, to evaluate climate change. Um, 1983, when the project started, climate change was not a, a significant issue on most people's radar. Um, just to take a quick look at um, the tree species composition of the whole forest, um, what you see here is I've highlighted the white pine and red oak, which are the dominant species, uh, particularly white pine. And um, these are the uh, various components in different management schemes. Um, as you can see, the volume is continually increasing. Um, we do have a strong component of, of hemlock, spruce, and uh, red maple in particular. Oh, sorry. So this year, um, this past winter, there was a uh, significant harvest at Hope Forest. Uh, the map on the left, all the green areas is where the harvest took place. Um, you can see some red exclusion blocks that we're saving as control blocks. Um, a 250 foot buffer around the um, saltwater area, the estuarine areas. Um, so it's a significant portion of the uh, east side of the road was was harvested. Barry will be talking a little bit more about that as we go on. So here's a map showing a couple of comparisons. The map on the left shows a harvest that was done in 1988. The red is highlighting the um, gaps that were created during that harvest. Um, other gaps were natural gaps that are existed on the property at, at that time. Um, the gaps that were harvested created in 1988. Um, there was about a 40% basal area removal in those blocks that were harvested. Um, but when that is spread out over the entire study area, it was only about a 12% removal. On the right-hand side, um, you can see the forest, ch forest change map that came from uh, G-Light imagery that was done or LIDAR imagery. And this was captured in July of this year. All the red is indicating where there's been sig significant forest change uh, since the previous LIDAR work that was done. I think, believe that was in 2015. The, um, you will notice there, there are some red spots 
in some of the buffer zones, um, and those are primarily due to blowdowns. Um, a lot of those uh, holiday um, storms that we've had over the last five years um, have resulted in some significant blowdown areas. There's a couple of photos showing some of the pre and post harvest. Um, the one on the left is pre-harvest, obviously, and the, the one on the right is the post-harvest. Um, and here's, here's another shot to, to look at that as well. And, uh, Barry can talk about this more when we get to her. I um, just wanted to highlight the fact that we do have this LIDAR imagery and some of the things that can be done with it. Um, this is just one illustration that was created looking at the, the side view of the forest canopy um, that was done from the previous flights in 2015. Here's the shot that was taken in 2021, um, and it really highlights um, the, the strength of the LIDAR imagery. Um, you're basically seeing um, individual trees there and the salt marsh is, is on the right-hand side. It's just showing what the potential is for um, LIDAR and uh, future research here and the ability of LIDAR to help uh, doing some of this analysis. So um, where today's topic is about climate change. Um, we all know what climate change is, what it looks like. Um, certainly seeing symptoms of it today, even in Maine, um, you know, particularly with um, rising uh, sea levels and the impacts on the, on the coast. So to sort of speculate and talk about some of the climate change related uh, impacts here at Holt Forest, um, we've have, had a significant loss of hardwood regeneration um, in the illustration here shows in different gap types and in the canopy, you know, the loss of um, oak regeneration, in particular, the red arrows significantly show the loss of um, red oak regeneration within these uh, different gap types and within the forest itself. And um, to talk about deer here in Arousic, um, deer populations have increased significantly since the start of this study. Um, the, the estimates that I heard that uh, density is as high as 50 to 60 per square mile. Um, an ideal density is closer to 15 per square mile. Um, though deer increase in deer numbers, there's a lot of factors that play into it. Um, I would say that uh, climate change plays into it because of the um, impacts during the winter. Uh, winter is generally a period when deer populations are heavily impacted. And with the milder winters, uh, survivorship has been much higher. And I believe that that's been a significant contribution to increases in deer population. Here's another look at, in particular, at some oak seedlings. Um, there was a large mass crop in 2010 of acorns. and in the following year, the oak seedlings shown in the lower right hand image were the dominant um, feature, the dominant plant feature in the uh, understory on the forest floor. Um, they were just so dense. I mean, if you look at the graph and the table on the left, you can see uh, very, very high numbers. And it shows the gradual decrease in those numbers and the browsing that took place on those numbers. Um, and you can look at the chart, uh, the, the graph there sh that shows seeds and seedlings, measuring the seeds. And um, you can see particularly in 2010 um, and 2011, the, the seedlings that resulted from that study. We had a similar large Last year, two years ago, um, but for some reason we did not have the same impact within the on the forest floor. The germination rates were very, very low um, for uh, an unknown reason at this point. I'm not sure 
what the what the reason was for that low um, low numbers of, of oak, new oak seedlings. Another quick topic I'll look at is fruit counts. Um, doing fruit counts over the years. This was a project that we had to abandon in uh, about 20 uh, t before 2010. Um, you can see in the upper left hand corner, the graph shows fruit counts within the gap areas, the harvest gap areas. Um, those gradually decreased um, because of the, um, I think the growing in of the gaps. A lot of those are, are raspberries or rubus species. So there were decreases there. Um, you can see on the lower right hand side, we we're getting similar decreases within the canopy areas. Um, but what this doesn't show is a complete loss of fruit that we had, uh, but in particular, um, Aurelia, or um, also called wild sarsaparilla. Um, there was a complete loss of that within the forest, and I, I believe that was mostly due to deer browsing. Um, another species that I'll highlight is um, in the understory are lady slippers. Um, you know, it used to be that on any morning you could take a walk out here when they're in flower and see hundreds of flowers. Um, these days, seeing one or two flowers on any morning walk is um, is what you're seeing. Um, some of this can certainly be um, attributed to closing canopies, uh, closing forest canopy, uh, but I I mostly blame um, browsing and by white-tailed deer. Uh, another species that we've been monitoring, red-backed salamanders. Um, a number of years ago, there was a paper that proposed that um, the two color phases of red-backed salamanders that are com most commonly seen, there's a red-backed phase and a lead-back phase. Um, on this graph, it's tracing the numbers that we've found of those, of those species. This is the percent of each of those different phases. Uh, this paper was predicting that with rising temperatures and warming trends that the percentage of lead back salamanders would increase. Um, our numbers of red back salamanders have stayed relatively stable over the years, and there has certainly not been any increase in the percentage of, of lead backs um, within our study area. So who knows if that uh, proposed theory is will hold up or will prove to be true. Uh, one area that we can de definitively say that there's been a significant change in a population, uh, when we talk about flying squirrels, um, what we've seen here is a complete loss of northern flying squirrels and southern flying squirrels um, taking over the forest, so to speak. Um, and this is not just limited to, to Maine, um, the same sort of um, uh, switch in uh, ranges has been shown in Ontario and Quebec as well, uh, with the southerns creeping north as much as 200 kilometers and the northerns receding quite a, about that same distance. There are some areas of overlap. Um, there's been some reports of hybrids. Um, Holly University of Maine was doing some work and she was interested in capturing northern flying squirrels and she had to travel all the way to Presque Isle before trapping any northern flying squirrels at all. Um, just a little bit of background on southerns and northerns and their compatibility. Um, southerns carry a, a tapeworm um, that's actually fatal to northern flying squirrels. So when they their ranges overlap, um, the northerns tend to disappear and the southerns tend to dominate. Another change that's been very definitive, I'm sure you've all experienced these same changes in your, your landscapes in Maine, um, is the d domination of deer ticks. Now, this is a look at ticks that we've been pulling off mice. We started in 1989 doing this. Uh, we've been collaborating with the um, Vector Borne Disease Lab of Maine Medical Center for all of these years. And you can see that um, in the later years, the deer ticks 
have uh, totally overtaken the um, yeah, prominence on, on mice and voles and other critters in the forest. It's just uh, that same trend is continued to, to the present day. Um, but they, we just have uh, had a paper accepted uh, describing this phenomenon in the Journal of Medical Entomology. Um, just to talk about some of the invasive and other troublesome species that we face. Um, well, many of these things have been uh, human induced. Um, I think that climate change tends to exacerbate some of them. Uh, we talk about invasive plant species uh, from Asiatic bittersweet um, to honeysuckles, um, Japanese barberry, which is a big problem, uh, particularly further south in Maine. Uh, we've been fortunate at Hope Forest that we have a minimal number of invasive plants, a little bit of barberry. Um, and uh, for the first time in the last two years, I discovered some Asiatic bittersweet growing here. We talk about insect pests like gypsy moth, brown tail moth. Um, those are phenomena that are certainly created by humans, but who knows what impacts there are from um, climate change and warming climate trends. The other critter that's here, um, the hemlock woolly adelgid, we're certainly seeing that here at Holt Forest and uh, just starting to have some um, mortality from that. And that's definitely something that is being enabled by climate change as things warm up, the adelgid is better able to survive over the winter. Uh, just briefly, I want to mention something totally new and something that I was unaware of until this year. Um, we had an outbreak of this little critter here called the um, oak leaf rolling weevil. And um, the first time that I've ever noticed it at Old Forest. And um, we had some fairly significant um, oak defoliation because of this critter. Um, according to um, some of the forest entomologists at uh, in the main forest service um, they believe that it was probably a combination of uh, a very warm dry spring um, that brought out the numbers of these individuals and um, because of the reduced uh, volume of oak within the area it probably hit harder on the oak trees than it normally would have so very interesting um, climate change, uh, dry, warm springs are unusual, and um, if we're expecting more of those, there could be more problems that, that arise from that. Um, one last slide I'll share here, the um, redback vole populations. Redback voles are, are northern species, um, and we've seen de decreasing numbers. Um, could it be climate related? Um, Possibly when we're unsure whether there's climate related or related to changes in habitat, um, loss of herbaceous vegetation. Uh, voles are, um, are seed eaters, but they're also very dependent on herbaceous vegetation. And um, loss of herbaceous vegetation could lead to a decrease in population by um, lessening the habitat quality for them. Um, one thing to think about in, you know, in terms of forest management, what are the species that are gonna take hold in Maine? Um, we talk about Northern red oak and white pine, which are the dominant species in the Southern part of the state becoming more important. Um, so when we think about forest management, uh, we need to think how we're gonna regenerate these, these species of trees um, as they take hold in a greater portion of the state. Um, again, I think, you know, forest managers really need to think about, um, you know, maintaining a, a diversity of tree species and a diversity of age classes as a way to increase the resiliency of, of our forest going into the future. I'll close it right there. So thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Jack. 
Uh, that was an incredible distillation of decades and decades and decades worth of research um, in one place. Um, I, I want to highlight for everybody that uh, when a forester such as Barry uh, is going into manage a woodlot or come up with a management plan or work with a landowner, um, they typically don't have the luxury of having that much information um, about what's going on on the site. So uh, it's I'm sure, Barry, that it was a real treat for you to have all that background knowledge uh, and information as you were um, getting ready to come up with the uh, with the harvest plan. Um, so Jack, thanks again. We will have a couple of questions for you, I think, in the Q&A section, but that was a really excellent background and there is a lot going on at the whole. So Barry, with all that information that Jack shared, tell us about the harvest. Okay, thank you. And thanks to Jack for that. Uh, it must, it, it's a fairly brief version of all the research that's been going on over the years. So I would definitely defer to Jack uh, for anything regarding that. Um, my approach to what's going on in the whole is really much more of an operational forest forester approach, but it was, it's been a real pleasure to work with Jack, Jack on that. Uh, just a word about the whole, uh, Jack spoke quite a bit about the research that's going on there, but the, the whole forest is also a demonstration forest and it's primarily an oak pine forest type very similar to a lot of land in this part of the state. And I wanted to take the approach to harvesting as looking at it from the same, a similar perspective as any small landowner would look at their land. You know, I, I own this land. What's the best way to manage it for diversity of objectives and thinking about climate change? What are some of the logistical things that I need to consider? So, in that sense, the Holt Forest is really kind of a, a good example for a lot of small landowners, what they can do or possibly not do with their land um, with the background of research. And what I'd like to see come out of this in the future is um, some research that is really geared towards more the lay person, the small landowner, maybe a one or two page paper, you know, if I cut my forest, what's going to happen to the tick population? What's going to happen to the small mammal population? Because there's been a lot of academic research that's been going on, but I see this forest as a real opportunity to connect long-term research with on-the-ground work that uh, land managers and um, landowners can, can do. And we'll be talking a lot more about the operational aspects of the harvest on the tour on Friday. And I know that a lot of you won't be able to attend that. So I'll try and cover it as much as I can today. Um, the harvest that Jack mentioned, the last one on this 300 acre property was about 33 years ago. And on a 300 acre some property, that's a long time to go without a timber harvest if you're actually doing management. So that was one of the reasons to do it. And we wanna see the effects of doing a regular timber harvest on all these various ecological aspects of the forest. So it's kind of a combination, kind of the best of both worlds. And just a note about recreation, um, the Holt Forest does not encourage recreation. We don't have marked trails and maps and that sort of thing. We don't want to have people just tromping around and tromping around uh, willy nilly, you know, over through all the research plots and that sort of thing. We very much welcome organized tours, and Jack is very good at leading tours. There are certain trails that we follow, so it minimizes the impact on the research. But I just wanted to say it's not like a park where people can just go and park and walk around and enjoy whatever recreational activities they want to do. Um, but we do welcome people that really want to come and learn about the ecology and the research that's been happening there. So we chose one, um, basically the east side of the road, as Jack mentioned, the properties bisected by the old stage road. And we chose the east side of the property to do our timber harvest and uh, the harvest area, the, the initial acreage was re reduced quite a bit. We didn't do any harvesting at all within the shoreland zone and no harvesting within 50 feet of the road, the public road. And that's because of um, 
very restrictive town regulations that go way beyond state shoreland zone and harvesting standards that we had to work with. So we just kind of set those areas aside. Um, and, and that was part of our plan. And the harvest area includes the research area and also an area outside the, the 40 hectare research block that Jack showed in his map. So we also, Jack and I walked around pre-harvest and set aside several blocks within the study area where there would be no harvesting as, as kind of a, a control area. And we also set up a couple of patch cuts, you know, half to one acre patch cuts as part of the research demonstration area to see what's gonna be happening in those plots that would be different than the rest of it. And the loggers we worked with were um, Don Cole and Will Cole of Trees Limited of um, Sydney. And they're one of the most well-known and well-respected uh, professional logging companies in the state. So we are fortunate to be able to work with them. Will actually just recently retired from the board of Maine Tree Foundation. So they were the loggers that were chosen. We used a cut to length harvest system and Jack showed a few pictures of the, the forwarder and the um, processor that was used. As a forester, I would have loved to have done the mark marking of the trees for a selection harvest there because it's it's just a wonderful opportunity there's a lot going on there um, but in this in order to expedite the harvest and also save some money for the main tree foundation I drew up a very uh, detailed harvest prescription and gave that share that with Don and I visited with him once a week during the harvest and we kind of talked about the recommendation, tweaked a bit here and there, and the final result I think came out very well. My work with a, as a forester was to lay out the boundaries of the harvest area, um, lay out a couple of, one critical stream crossing, another critical access area over a ledgy area, um, monitor soil conditions and that sort of thing. Um, but it was great working with Don and Will because they really, they understand silviculture, they understand the objectives. So uh, that, that worked out really well. Um, there was approximately 40 acres of that block of land that we did not harvest and that was due to the town, the extreme town regulations. There's about three acres we didn't harv harvest because there was, um, red maple wetlands that we just basically stayed out of. And then we just ran out of season. They started harvesting about October of last year and ended in March. And that just wasn't quite enough time to get all the acreage covered that we wanted, but we did our best. Um, one thing we did do was we put in a new access road prior to the harvest. And those of you going on the tour will see that that was an expensive access road but it is there it's an investment in the future and that's something that small landowners really need to consider as well as is access to their woodlot not just for a current harvest but also to be enable future management um activities such as in the whole we we after the harvest we put in several deer exclosures and it was really handy having that access road and wood yard to bring in all the supplies we needed and stage them off road where they're in, in kind of a safe place. And thinking about climate adaptation, that's always something I think about now when I'm doing a timber harvest. Uh, one thing is to think about is changing storm events. In the past, we could have always kind of counted on December to March as a frozen ground winter ground con conditions, great time for harvest. But that's very uh, unpredictable right now. So we have that and that makes it a challenge for both the land manager and of course for the logger as well. Um, change, you know, making sure that stream crossings are well sited and any culverts or crossings are oversized maybe compared to what we used to do just because we're getting bigger storm events than we used to. So those are some considerations. 
another couple of specific considerations for tree species change and that sort of thing. There is some white oak on the Holt Forest, not a whole lot, but that's something I really want to encourage along with the red oak, just because it's not that common of a species, but I think it will become more common in the future. There is also a fair amount of red spruce on the Holt Forest, and that's a species that, as most of you know, is kind of at high risk for future climate change. Its range is going to be moving northward. It's not really adaptable to a, a variety of situations, but I, I just really like red spruce, so kept it as a component of the forest. And looking into the future, I think that um, trying to create a forest with a variety of native species, sizes, age classes, densities, um, will create a more resilient forest in the future because there's so many unknowns. And that's something that I, I really tried to practice um, as, as we did this harvest. And I'm really looking forward to seeing some of the post-harvest research, what will be happening there. You know, I was involved in a, a, a citizen science project regarding ticks that a study sponsored by the university separate from the Holt. And one discovery they made in their 2020 data was that the uh, black-legged tick populations were definitely lower in areas that had been harvested sometime within the past 20 years as compared to areas that were hadn't been harvested for a long time. So I think that kind of information is really practical, good research for um, landowners and land managers to have. And I look forward to seeing more of that on the Holt. Um, and um, I guess I will, I'm probably running out of time now, Amanda, am I running out of time? Um. You have a minute or two if you want to kind of wrap up, but you're okay. Good. Um, yeah, okay. I'll just talk a little bit about uh, carbon storage and sequestration. Again, I've been thinking a lot about that uh, recently. And in the forest here, I think there's value in both the older, bigger trees that are storing carbon, is an important part of forest resiliency and. Um, in going into the future and also having some younger, more quickly growing species as part of it. So again, I tried to, in the, in the work that I do to balance both of those, the, the sequestration and, and the storage. Um, and the potential uh, increase in invasive threats, that's something else that we thought about going in. You know, We do have the hemlock woolly adelgid on the property as the climate warms up, we're going to be having to deal more with, you know, the brown tail mo moth, the oak leaf a roller that that uh, Jack mentioned. The emerald ash borer will be here sooner or later. Well, luckily, there's not a whole lot of ash on the forest, um, but there's a lot of wild cards that we're dealing with going into the future that we really that will impact what we can do and not do in the ground. One is the markets for carbon. Another really big question mark that all anyone managing forests is dealing with now is wood markets. And basically markets for low grade wood, especially softwood, if you're trying to manage a forest and improve it, you have to be able to sell the low grade wood. Otherwise it's just kind of talk or high grading. And so that's, I see as a really big challenge going into the future. So I guess I'll, um, stop my spiel there and wait for any questions later on. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Barry. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned carbon because unfortunately that's kind of the elephant in the room for a lot of folks that are thinking about climate change in forests, but also climate impacts uh, in the broader sense. So thank you for uh, adding that on to a very long list of really important information that you consider in that timber harvest. Um, I want to turn to Shane Dugan, um, who's going to just share a few reflections on all of this discussion about science and research and carbon and climate change. And what does that all mean to landowners? So Shane, are you able to turn your camera on and unmute and share a few thoughts? Mm -hmm. We can hear you. That should come up. I turn my camera and we'll see what comes up. 
Okay, well, feel free to start talking if the, oh, maybe it's working. There we go. <laughs> hey, there's Shane. All Even right. better. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I, I'm Shane Dugan. I'm the local district forester at the Maine Forest Service. And I don't know, Amanda, that's <laughs> that's a lot of information to uh, to squeeze into a little tiny short segment. I think what I can maybe better do is put in a plug for the district forester crew at the Maine Forest Service. Uh, there's We're basically your free forest resource for all uh, or a resource for all things forestry related statewide. There's 10 of us around the state. Um, uh, we provide outreach and education for landowners, loggers, and fellow foresters. Um, I think our official mission is to help people make informed decisions about forest management. And that includes all the things that you included there, which now involves invasive species and climate change and carbon sequestration and all these things we're all trying to wrap our brains around. Uh, in events like this and moving forward in the world. Um, basically, we can answer questions about all aspects of forest management, um, individual and forest, individual tree and forest health, um, how individual laws pertain to different forest practices and how they pertain to operating in and around resources. Uh, basically, everything you ever want to know about forestry, but we're afraid to ask. Um, and if we don't know the answers, uh, we have a great team of people behind us, entomologists and pathologists, civil culturists, we have a good depth of knowledge to ask um, and maybe learn something in the process too. I cover uh, Cumberland, Androscoggin and Saget Hawk counties. I see my colleague Alyssa Gregory is on this uh, webinar and she covers Knox, uh, Lincoln and Kennebec counties. Like I say, there's eight other district foresters covering statewide, depending on where you own your land. So we're here, we're a free resource, take advantage of us. I'll be at the field tour on Friday. I think Alyssa will be as well, and maybe another forester, uh, Mike Richard, who covers Oxford County will be there. Um, and you can chat us up then if you want, we're available to make, uh, to schedule site visits and things like that. Or our information is available on the main forest service website. All right, thank you, Shane. Thanks, um, I would, yeah, awesome. And Alyssa says, yep, I will be there. So <laughs> I, I would love to spotlight our other speakers and uh, start into our Q&A section. So we've had some good questions come up and I know there's a lot to uh, a lot that, that people could, uh, could share. Um, I wanna go back to a question that Todd shared earlier while Jack was speaking. So he was asking, is forest change limited to canopy cover or can those data detect other changes? So that may have been answered by a lot of the slides that um, that Jack shared, but um, Jack, do you want to address uh, is, is forest change limited to canopy cover, or can uh, those data detect other changes? I think they can detect a lot of other changes. Um, Aaron is a lot more familiar with the technology than I am, so I would uh, look to him to to answer that more completely. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Um, it, the it, the GLight data, and I saw Logan put it in the chat, is is LIDAR data. It's um, statewide. We have LIDAR data that's probably about one to two hits per square meter. Uh, the GLight data that was taken at the Holt is about 10 to 15 hits per square meter. So about 10 to 15 times the density that we have here in Maine. I haven't looked at it in much detail, but I'm pretty sure that um, you could probably see ground level changes and changes in the um, in the uh, understory as well so that that is something that i think worth exploring one of the things that i was really excited to do with the lidar data was to combine it with the long-term bird data that jack had collected to see if we could look at micro site uh, habitat selection by birds so i think it's a really rich data set and excited that nasa was able to refly it after the harvest nice thank you so i i would love for questions that really kind of tease at the intersection between uh, research and uh, and practice. Um, and uh, Gary had asked a good question that I've seen a few comments on in the chat. So Gary says, I wonder if the tick numbers would still be lower if invasive plants like Japanese barberry uh, became uh, the most common regeneration. And uh, Ken added, uh, research in Connecticut strongly indicates that barberry serves as a refuge for ticks. And uh, Jack added, yes, indeed, same in Maine. Um, some of the highest densities of ticks are in dense barberry dominated areas. So before we get to Gary's next question about hemlock woolly adelgid, I'd love to think about barberry and ticks and regeneration. So for for, for Barry perhaps, um, or for any of you, um, uh, <laughs> what, are, what would you like to do or what can be done to try to reduce uh, Japanese barberry and other invasive plants that might affect those tick populations? 
That's a really great question. There's always more you can do. You can never cross invasive species off your to-do list. And I talk with <laughs> landowners about this a lot. And you can never really eradicate them totally. The advice I generally give to landowners is to, if there's scattered individuals, to get those because they're going to be spreading. If you have an area where there's a really thick infestation and it's spreading, kind of start from the outside edges and work your way in. If you start right in the thick of things, you're going to get pretty discouraged. And you'll also have to keep after it because most of these invasives also have a lot of seed bank in the soil and they will sprout and re-sprout. Um, and there's certain, so you have to keep after it year after year. Um, and there's uh, certain species too that are more responsive to herbicides than others are some you can some things you can control mechanically you know with tools and digging and that sort of thing if they're not that big and they're scattered but certain things like bittersweet i find is really hard to control and you unless you do use herbicides i'm not an applicator but i su definitely suggest working with someone who has the knowledge about that. And there are a lot of such uh, applicators around. Thanks, Barry. I don't know, do uh, Jack or Jonathan want to weigh in on, you know, on controls of invasives at the whole, uh, over the long term, kind of looking into the, the coming decades? Well, I, I can speak to, I mean, we're just in a very uh, fortunate situation in that um, invasives have never been very common here. Um, we have a few roadside patches of, of invasives that have not been widespread into the forest, but the occurrence of some of these invasive species in the forest is very uh, limited, um, surprisingly so, because I know that other places in Arousic and particularly some of these coastal sites, um, I look over towards uh, Harpswell, um, and there's just incredible invasive problems there and things that we're not seeing um, here at Whole Forest. So um, we've been very fortunate so far that they are very low densities and we've been able to control them by just pulling individual plants up and uh, keeping under control that way. Yeah, I just chime in too and say that um, lots of times with invasives, you ideally you would wanna get rid of them or minimize them bring them down to a dull roar before you do any harvesting or any uh, more uh, active land management activities because they can get spread around by equipment. It can get, they can get spread around by people, by dirt on your boots, whatever. Um, but lots of times landowners can't afford that. But I would, I have in the past offered to people, well, if you do a timber harvest here, you know, you may not be wanting to do it for income for, money you know for like a, a, as a harvest income but you can take that money and reinvest it in the land by using the money to pay for invasives control which can be expensive if you have a bad infestation and that way you're basically investing the money back in land and trying to restore it and bring it back to a more healthy forest because that seems to be a an objective for most landowners I work with is to have a healthy forest and if help a forest that's full of invasives is not healthy, but you can generate income from timber harvesting to do some forest health restoration. Thank you for that. Uh, Jonathan, did you want to add anything on that question? Okay. Much more capable folks have addressed. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, so I hate to add another invasive into the mix, but uh, Gary had another uh, comment um, about uh, dealing with mortality from head hemlock woolly adelgid. Sorry, that's Todd's comment, commenting on. Okay, here we go. So Gary says, I think hemlock woolly adelgid will become more problematic, uh, uh, more inland as climate changes. Arousic is probably already in the area where, where it can do well. Possibly the warmer winters could accelerate the damage and mortality could occur in less than 10 years. And Todd build, was building on that um, and asked if there are plans for how to deal with mortality from hemlock woolly adelgid, um, salvage logging or leaving snags, or are there research questions that the forest could address? So any of you are welcome to answer that question about hemlock woolly adelgid and mortality and future management decisions.
I'll give a stab at that. I, I know um, it has it spread beyond Arousic. I know of um, infestation in Waldeboro and in Rockport. I know that the hemlock adelgid has gone that at least that far. And these are in forest situations, not you know landscape uh, home type trees. I know in the Waldeboro forest, they recently, along with Colleen Tierling, who is the state and one of the state entomologists, they did a release of a parasitic beetle. And they're hoping that that will work. It's pretty expensive. The beetles are tiny little things and they cost about $2.50 each. So you have to <laughs> hope that you, you release them where there's enough, enough food, enough adelgids for them to stick around and eat the adelgids but not so many that they're overwhelmed. So that I think is, there's still a lot that we can learn about that. Um, another issue to consider is Shoreland's own regulations affecting uh, hemlock because oftentimes hemlocks are in pure stands on steep slopes next to the water. And so there's a lot of issues and it's it's a very complicated situation because the shoreland zone rules are there to protect water quality but if you have a huge stand of dead trees and no regeneration coming up and then the trees start breaking off and falling over that's not going to do much for protecting the water so again and Arousic has very stringent regulations regarding that and we haven't even begun to deal with it. So it, it's a challenge. There's no easy answers, but I, I see it, it. I think it's probably going to get worse. The situation is going to get worse before it gets better, unfortunately. Thanks for that. And I guess from a kind of a research perspective or longer term um, you know, goals for the whole perspective, um, I don't know, for Jack or for Jonathan, could you see you know, salvage logging or developing some research around that? Uh, potentially becoming part of what the whole studies. I, I think it's certainly a, a possibility. Uh, one of the, the directions that the, the Board of Main Tree has said is to stand up um, not only a scientific advisory committee for the whole research forest, but also a community advisory committee. I think Barry highlighted it earlier, you know, really trying to seek to understand those small woodland owners you know, what are the questions they're trying to understand as they manage their lands into the future? And can we ensure that we're, we're possible framing, framing research questions to provide that knowledge uh, out into the field? Awesome, thanks, Jonathan. Shane, I don't know if you're still able to uh, unmute and uh, turn on your camera, but um, we had a question come in. Um, this is before the carbon question. I know that's such an elephant in the room, but uh, David Bryn was asking, what would silviculture look like if one elects not to use herbicides or how do we minimize disturbance, human disturbance in ways that do not promote invasives? It seems invasives must be controlled before commercial timber harvest. So uh, Shane, I'll pitch this to you, but to address that, um, I'm sure you talk with landowners that have that kind of perspective. How do how would you address that question about silviculture and uh, invasives and human disturbance? It's a lot to unpack. I I think I'll uh, I'll borrow from my recently retired colleague uh, Andy Schultz and say the answer in forestry is very often it depends, um, and that's true especially for invasives and when it comes to silviculture, it really depends on what the composition of your individual forest is, and what the invasives that you're dealing with are. It's fair to say in most cases, and Barry has some experience with this, I know if, if you're not gonna use herbicide, it's gonna take a lot of sweat and a lot of calloused hands um, to handle that mechanically in some way, depending on, and, and a lot of commitment because it's, it's the year that you injure your back and don't get out there to continue with your efforts that uh, those invasives regain all the ground that, you, you know, that you've taken back from them. Um, there's a few, you know, for specific invasives, there's different techniques that you can use. Um, I think of the most innovative one I can think of off the top of my head is for like controlling glossy buckthorn with these black plastic bags that you can prune and, and cover buckthorn in, which kind of burns them up um, and keeps them from re-sprouting. So it's really an individual case, um, but it's something that takes a heck of a lot of time commitment. Um, and, and like I say, a lot of callous hands. It's something that's, if you're gonna be there, if the question as, uh, asker is going to be there on Friday. It's something we could talk about a little bit more specifically. Maybe it's a good opportunity to schedule a time to, for us to get into your woodlot together so we can see what you have and, and sort of what might apply in your specific situation. Okay. 
Thank you for that, Shane. And uh, in the wise words of Nancy Olmsted, one potentially important thing regarding preventing invasive species is to ask for clean equipment and logging contracts so that invasive species do not hitch a ride to the property and being willing to pay a cleaning fee if needed. So all those things will help minimize the spread of the invasives, which are factoring in all of these other management challenges. Uh, I hate to say, but the top of the hour has certainly snuck up on us. Um, I'm sure some folks need to jump off and uh, participate in other events, um, but I want to take a quick moment and thank all of our speakers. Uh, thank Jonathan and Jack and Barry and Shane. Um, and uh, we're really excited to see folks on Friday at the Holt Forest that where we'll have a chance to dig in deeper um, on all of this. Um, I did see the question about carbon management and we'll see if we can collect some resources. Really, that's a whole topic unto itself. Um, but uh, thank you everybody for joining. If you do have an additional question, we'll keep an eye on the chat window for another moment. Um, but thank you so much to our speakers and thanks everybody for participating today.